my trailblazers. Here's our uh, third movie in the first couple weeks of school, and this one is uh, all about scientific inquiry. A lot of these concepts should be familiar to you. I know you were taught them in elementary, but we just do need to review to make sure we're all on the same page. So what is scientific inquiry? What does that mean? You guys probably were taught uh, the scientific method. We don't really use that anymore um, because it's not a set thing. Instead, we refer to the process of investigation as uh, scientific inquiry. So it's the diverse. Diverse means different. It's the different ways in which scientists study the natural world and come up with explanations based on what they've gathered. So this graphic here is really good because it shows that it's a continuous circle. Most scientific investigations do not stop with one experiment. They continue on. All right, so inquiry always begins with a question about an observation. Maybe when you were itty bitty, you asked the question, why is the sky blue? Sometimes your parents give you really cute answers. Or if you're my kid, the answer you got is, well, when blue light hits the molecules in the atmosphere, uh, most of that light bounces off in all directions. Uh, so the blue light gets scattered all around the sky. That's why we observe blue light. Um, and she was probably a little kid and looked at me like, huh? But um, it was those questions, that curiosity that leads to science. So questions come from, obviously it comes from being curious, from what we experience, from what we see, touch, taste, smell here and inferences we make. A lot of people infer that the sky is blue because the ocean reflects on it. I mean, that's not sounds silly to some of us, but a lot of people used to think that back in the day. All right, you guys, guys, I know sometimes you hate researching, but it's really, really, really important, especially in science, because people might already have done the work for you. So um, we have to be careful of how we use the internet. But there are, it's a wonderful tool for us to see what evidence and information people have already gathered. All right, developing hypotheses. So a hypothesis is a, sp a possible answer to a sp sp bleh, scientific question. It is not a prediction. Okay, predictions are what we think are going to happen. Hypotheses are answers to questions. They're not fact either. Okay. So we should test everything in science, everything that we possibly can. As a matter of fact, hypotheses must be testable. I can't say I think the sky is blue because magic fairies are sprinkling dust on it uh, every morning. I can't test to see if magic fairies are there because I cannot observe magic fairies. So we have to be really careful when we do scientific investigation and make sure that our hypotheses are testable. All right, designing and conducting experiments. We, um, we want to make sure that we're really thorough, and so we follow something called experimental design. Experimental design makes sure that we follow a step-by-step -step process. We define our problem. What is our question? What do we want to find out? Um, we are going to write our hypothesis in here. Um, we're going to determine what's important to us. What are we, what are we looking for? We're going to design the experiment. We're going to connect conduct the experiment, collect all the data. Then we have to analyze that data. We have to interpret it or come to some conclusions, and then we need to verify it. So experimental design, it pretty much means designing an experiment. All right, we went over variables, and we're going to be, you know, we're working in class on variables. It's very important that you understand the difference between the three. Uh, so controlling variables, I want to go back to this for a minute. They're the factors that say the same in an experiment. There can be many controlled variables in an experiment. They have to be present. They, you must have controlled variables in correct experimental design because we want to make sure we're only measuring the change the independent variable causes. Let's look at our example. So those group of folks uh, in that graphic were answering the question, does water temperature affect to the dissolving speed of M&Ms. Excuse me. So they kept, the, what they're going to change, the independent variable, is the temperature of the water. What they do not change, what they keep the same in every uh, trial, is the color of the M&M. So perhaps they used yellow every single time. The amount of water, and maybe they used 40 milliliters of water every single time. They used the exact same dish, and they didn't stir it or deserve disturb it. They just left the M&M in the water. 
Those variables, the color of the M&M, the amount of water, the type of dish, and not stirring or disturbing either place are the controlled variables. We keep them the same because we only want to know uh, if water factor, if water temperature is affecting the dissolving speed. If we were stirring some of them and not others, if we uh, were doing different colored M&Ms, we couldn't be sure if it was dissolving because of the water temperature, the color of the M&Ms, or is because we were stirring it. That's why we can only have one thing that changes, and that's our independent variable. Uh, so a controlled experiment is what we ex we always want to aim for, and that's where there's only one variable being tested, okay? So if I look at my example, perhaps I'm testing fertilizer. My control probably doesn't get fertilizer. All my other experimental uh, plants are going to get different types of fertilizer. All right, we talked about bias last week, but let's just... Uh, I told you personal bias, cultural bias, and I mentioned experimental bias. Let me touch on experimental bias again. The way that we get away from that is to make sure we have a large sample size. What does that mean? It would be very wrong of you to say, if you, if you only asked your friends that you know enjoy your type of music and that you hang out with, if you asked five of them what's their favorite type of music, you're going to have bias there. They're, you all probably like the same type of music. To ask people what the best type of music is, you'd have to ask the largest population sample size you could. Maybe you go to the mall and ask 300 people in a day what their favorite type of music is. So to make sure you don't have experimental bias, make sure you're, you're using a large sample size. Data. Data, data, however you want to say it. And the plural of data is data. So data are the facts, figures, and other evidence that we gather. We gather them through either uh, qualitative observations or quantitative. Always, always, always in here, I'm going to have you organize your data into some type of chart or table. Um, that just helps us to then go ahead and graph it. And why do we graph in science? Because we need to understand the data we gathered. And uh, next week, we're going to have more... Um, another video just on graphing and homework assignment just on graphing so that we're all on the same page. All right, conclusions. We've, you've seen this graphic before. This is that CER method, and this is pretty much it. Your claim in this case is generally your hypothesis. Your evidence is all the data you collected. Your reasoning is your conclusion. What are you saying? How, why did you get that result? Uh, the data, your conclusion, either supports or does not support your hypothesis, and then you need to tell why that happened. And we'll get more into this. We'll pra definitely practice this technique. All right, re replication, bleh, replication and repeated trials. Uh, repeated trials, we're going to not just do one uh, experiment of, uh, you know, one thing. If we're going to um, see what uh, lollipop flavor is the favorite in Southwest Middle School, I'd probably uh, do that trial at least three or four times to make sure maybe that cherry is the favorite flavor. If I just did it once, maybe people had colds, um, maybe some people were absent that day, you know, maybe they had something really hot the night before and they burnt their tongue. There's lots of things that can influence an investigation. If I do it more than once and my results tend to be the same, then I've probably done it right. Replication is a little bit different. That means another scientist repeats your experiment. And if they get the same results as you, that's great. That means you're both on the same page. However, if a scientist goes to replicate your experiment and does not get similar results, something's gone wrong, either on your end or theirs, and then you guys have to work out what that issue was. All right, communicate. Scientists communicate by giving talks at scientific meetings. They exchange information on the Internet. They publish articles on the journal. Um, so if we, you know, when you go to ted ed or ted or anything and we were going to watch this video of this woman talking about the surprising logical minds of babies she is a cognitive scientist she's sharing her information in this video it's 20 minutes long people in nine this week nine different languages are able to um um watch this video so this is a very powerful way that scientists are able to spend their uh, share their information Oops, I'm on the wrong slide here. Let me find out where I'm at. 
All right. All right, so gaining scientific knowledge. We just, we have to remember, I touched on this last week. Experiments allow us to study the natural world. So that's experiments. Sometimes, though, like we want to study things deep in our solar system or deep in outer space, and we can't really go there yet. We have not the technology. We can't experiment directly. So we are going to build machines that help us make those observations. For instance, very sophisticated telescopes and space probes that let us explore space since we can't, as humans, observe it directly. We also make models of things. Whether, you know, right now it's hurricane season. There's a tropical storm out in the Atlantic Ocean. Scientists make models of these hurricane tracking um, software to help us. Because, you know, while we do have planes that can go in and observe hurricanes, they can't stay very long. And making models helps us make predictions, which helps us save lives. So we, when we can't do actual experimental design or we can't do experiments, we're able to make observations um, with tools we've created and we use models as well. That's it for this, uh, this one. I hope you guys had a great day and I'll be talking to you soon.